Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for our symposium, Billy Strayhorn, Known and Unknown. I, I'm, we almost despaired that this event was not going to happen when you have everything all set up to go in June of 2020, and then the pandemic hits, and of course that took two to two years. And then we think, okay, so we'll do it in June of 23, and then the auditorium collapses. <laughs> and we think, <laughs> what is that, that character, Job Lipstick, who has that cloud that just goes over his head? Um, but everything that we have done so far this, uh, for this celebration has been so special and so wonderful. And I am very much looking forward to this afternoon and the, the concert tonight. I hope all of you will be able to stay and join us for that. Um, so we are uh, so grateful that we made it through to, to here and are able to um, realize the planning that has gone into this. Um, our keynote speaker, is David Haydu. He is Strayhorn's biographer and, as you most of you know, prominent writer on this music scene and beyond. He's the music critic for The Nation and a professor of journalism at Columbia University. And he was recently appointed by President Biden to the National Council on the Humanities. That's a fabulous uh, honor. So following his lecture entitled, Known and Unknown, Real and Imagined, we will hear presentations from a remarkable group of panelists. <clears throat> the participants include Lisa Barg, who is Associate Dean for Graduate Students at McGill University, and her upcom upcoming book, Queer Arrangements, Billy Strayhorn and Mid-Century Jazz Coll Collaboration is highly anticipated and sure to offer new perspectives on Strayhorn's life and work. No pressure. <laughs> um, Alice Clairbeau is the president of Billy Strayhorn Songs, Inc. And she has been so instrumental in maintaining the legacy of this marvelous musician and helping to make Stray, our Strayhorn Festival such an exciting occasion, even putting out fires as recently as this afternoon. Um, <laughs> Marlon Martinez, a talented bassist, composer, and band leader, will speak about his own encounters with Strayhorn, including a wonderful series of videos entitled Ever Up and Onward, a tribute to Billy Strayhorn. So fortunately, we got that thing fixed. <laughs> You can check these all out and speak further with Marlon downstairs in the Whittle Pavilion after the symposium and before the concert. And last but not least, our friend Bob O'Mealy will speak, will speak, the Zora Neale Hurston Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. He has worked on topics ranging from Ralph Ellison to Billy Holiday and Romar Bearden. He is able to look with fresh eyes at Strayhorn's creative output across all media. We have had Bob here many times working uh, on doing research and I always look forward to his visits. We will be packing a lot of fascinating information in the next few hours, so you can read more about our wonderful panel in your program booklet, which also is available online. <clears throat> if you would please hold questions to the end of the event so that we can make sure that we get through um, and hear everyone. We would uh, like to especially thank Dan Logan and the Rivada Foundation for their support for our jazz programming. They truly made our salute to Strayhorn possible. Thank you for coming. And now I'm gonna say something which, if you... <laughs> we have a punster amongst my staff, so I wanted you to know that this is not what I would have said, but it's what David told me to say. <laughs> 
So without, we will proceed without further ado. I mean, with further hey do. <laughs> Thank you. If I could deviate from my prepared text just for a second, I should clarify that I am not the David responsible for that pun. <laughs> There's more than one David here. But it was funny, and it's a nice way to, nice uh, positive way to start. Uh, thank you very dearly for that introduction. And I'm thrilled to be here and uh, grateful to Anne McLean and the, and the Library of Congress for inviting me to be part of this truly historic occasion. It is acutely fitting uh, that we should be honoring Billy Strayhorn in this context because Strayhorn loved libraries just as he relished museums and jazz clubs and good restaurants as important institutions for the preservation. <laughs> There's a little echoey sound. Should I move closer to the mic? as important institutions for the preservations of America's complicated, multidimensional cultural heritage. Libraries held a special place in Strayhorn's heart because the public library in his hometown had been the nexus of his coming of age in early life. Um, Strayhorn was raised in poverty in an alley in the African-American section of a mixed race, blue collar community in Pittsburgh called Homewood. When I was researching my book about Strayhorn Lush Life, I was fortunate to interview his best friend in, during his elementary school years, Harry Herforth, who shared Strayhorn's interest in classical music and in fact went on to become the first chair trumpet player uh, in the Cleveland Orchestra. Harry told me the following things about Billy Strayhorn. He said, we were together scrabbling to keep body and soul together, but we had a bond that was memorable. We gravitated together because of our artistic sensibility. He was very well read. He was an egghead as a kid. He talked about books and I talked about books that I had read. We talked about composers, authors, playwrights, not esoteric ones, but ones that were esoteric to us at the time. He would ask me if I had heard of Cesar Franck. Did you hear this? Have you heard that? That was 90% of our conversation. Directly across our, the street from our grade school was the Homewood Library. And it was a place of hallowed sanctity to each of us. We would go there, and as soon as you go into the door, it was like you were going into a temple a cathedral because of the books. The books were just full of wonderment. We both felt that the library was a cathedral of learning. It's end of quote from Harry Herforth. Now, Strayhorn's learning expanded in another way during the summers in his youth, when he would be sent for weeks at a time to stay at the home of his paternal grandmother in Hillsboro, North Carolina. It was a genteel place in a pastoral setting where Strayhorn had his first access to a piano and began picking out spiritual tunes that he heard his mother play on the Victrola. He idled his free time, which was considerable, walking along the bank of the Eno River and exploring the grounds of a, 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 a empty area, cat a corner to the house that was marked with a plaque that said, old slave cemetery with no marked graves. The experience, in fact, no graves at all, no markers at all. The experience clearly informed key aspects of Strayhorn's creative sensibility. First part, a profound love of nature, which he would give voice to in his many, many songs about floral life, and a deep sense of the tragedy of black history in America, which would take form most visibly in his active commitment to the civil rights movement. Now, I spent several days in Hillsboro visiting these locations firsthand with Strayhorn's nephew, Dr. Gregory Morris, who can't be here, as most of you know, uh, 
but was at the time the executor of the Strayhorn estate. We went together. And as Greg recalled to me, Strayhorn's sister, Georgia, his mother, said, quote, he was different when he came back from Hillsboro, Strayhorn was. Something good happened to him there. It was almost as if that's where he found himself. Now, with his intellectual curiosity nurtured in the public library and his emotional sensibility shaped in his solitude, can I say in his solitude here? In, his solitude. in Hillsboro, Billy Strayhorn began to find himself. Who did he find? What did he become? Who was he and why was he so important and why was what he did so important? that we should be gathering to honor him for three days as we are. We're focused on the library, so let's look at what books and articles in a typical American library said about Billy Strayhorn during his lifetime. Let's go back to a library during Strayhorn's lifetime. He lived from 1915 to 1967, and he was not unknown in his adult years. Writers mentioned him. What did they say about him? The Boston Globe, the Hartford Current, and the Philadelphia Inquirer all mentioned Strayhorn from time to time, referring to him as, quote, Duke Ellington's aide de camp. Okay. Well, what does that tell us? He was an, an aide of some sort to the great composer, pianist, and band leader, Duke Ellington. Well, that's not nothing. Strayhorn got some attention overseas, where the London Observer described him in a slightly different phrase as Duke Ellington's musical assistant. The Dallas Morning News used the same language. Uh, musical assistant. Well, that seems like maybe a little lesser than an aide, but a great and important person needs an assistant. That's a job. And it's better than being an assistant to a not so great and unimportant person. The New York Times referred to him as Duke Ellington's alter ego. And that's a step up. To be a mirror image or an emulation of a great and important person is to have an element of greatness and importance oneself in a way. Even if it's the other person person, I should learn how to not pop my peas, I'm not a singer, even if the other person first established the relevant measures of greatness and importance, which means that the two are not really equal. The San Francisco Chronicle called him, quote, Duke Ellington's sidekick. Sidekick. Sidekick, like mini me? Or Robin and Kid Flash and all those like juvenile superheroes in training in the comic books, or Ed McMahon in the old Johnny Carson show, or those comic novelty value characters that Walter Brennan and Gabby Hayes played in movie westerns? Sidekick. I'm not sure that's a compliment. The Associated Press went, went, so, far, went so far as to describe him as Duke Ellington's faithful Sancho Panza, Panza. And as novelty sidekicks go, at least that's a literary one. And faithful, that's good. Faithful's good, right? Unless faithfulness goes too far, which it can. During Strayhorn's lifetime, a variety of books that would have been found in the library in his day books about jazz and multiple biographies of Duke Ellington offered what added up to a narrative of Strayhorn's identity consistent with those shorthand phrases, aide de camp, alter ego, and the rest. Strayhorn was recognized often with praise, I'm learning, as a, as a, as a notable figure, perhaps the most notable among many in Duke Ellington's orbit. According to this narrative, Strayhorn began as a gifted novice in Pittsburgh, working as a soda jerker with no professional experience and limited ambition until he met Duke Ellington, and Duke Ellington 
groomed him, took him under his wing to help him burnish his genius and assist him in the fulfillment of Ellington's ever-expanding creative vision. I want to make an important point. A major part of this story is absolutely correct. Duke Ellington was a genius, a primary voice in musical history. Another part of this story is also correct. Ellington's vision was immeasurably vast and perpetually expanding. It is also true that Billy Strayhorn was working the soda counter and running deliveries for a pharmacy. Penfield Drugs in December 1938 when he met Duke Ellington. I know the story of that from interviewing the third person in the room, by the way, the person who introduced him, George, George Greenlee. The rest of that take on Billy Strayhorn, however, the standard narrative during his lifetime turns out to be false. As the contents of the Strayhorn collection here at the library now teach us, and as I learned from many interviews I conducted over nine years of research on Strayhorn. Before meeting Ellington, Strayhorn worked exhaustively in music, taking every opportunity he could find or create for himself in Pittsburgh. He wrote a full musical review called Fantastic Rhythm, Book, Words, and Music, complete with arrangements for a small orchestra. And the show ran for several years in black theaters around Western Pennsylvania, in and around Western Pennsylvania. When the Second World War came, the producer who I found and interviewed for, for my book took the sh joined the Navy, took the show, brought it to the Pacific, and staged it for, uh, for the Navy personnel in the Pacific, who were stationed in the Pacific. I should add that my little brown book, which would become a standard in the Ellington repertoire and later be recorded famously by Johnny Hartman and John, Hart, uh, and John Coltrane, began life in fantastic rhythm, as did other songs that Strayhorn would repurpose for the Broadway musical, Beggar's Holiday, and other projects. Before he met Ellington, Strayhorn had already written a few works of music we know well today. One was an extraordinarily ambitious art song he called Life is Lonely, which he retitled after people who had heard, people who had heard it started requesting that song about living the lush life. And he had written Something to Live For, which Ella Fitzgerald would later call her all-time favorite song. Ella's ardor for this song was palpable in the way she introduced it in her concerts, which is documented in live recordings that are available, widely available on CD. You could hear it, and she says, now we'd like to do one of the beautiful Duke Ellington songs. And your love has faded, he wrote in Pittsburgh, another song that Ellington would record with his name attached to the composer credit as it was for something to live for. Strayhorn included a number of these original pieces in the band book for the jazz group he led in Pittsburgh, the Mad Hatters, a mixed race group based on the Benny Goodman model, later expanded to a quintet also on the Goodman model. They were excellent. I know, I've heard the demo recordings they made. Uh, and they developed a following around Western Pennsylvania until a patron at a gig hollered out a, rac a racist slur, the vilest racist slur, which I will not repeat. Strayhorn survived by hiding in the back of, of, of a truck that the band commandeered to escape and the band broke up. He played solo piano at night at a Pittsburgh club. He registered compositions for copyright at a library right here. <laughs> he wrote arrangements for territory bands like the Bill Ludwig, Ludwig Orchestra. He wrote arrangements for society bands like the Buddy Malone Orchestra, a group for which he composed a piece that he called Smoky City which was later renamed Smata 
and which we all know through its recordings by the Duke Ellington Orchestra, with Ellington's name added to the credits. He served for a time as the pianist and primary arranger for a dance band, the Rex Edwards Orchestra, played dozens of dates as the pianist and arranger in the late 1930s. He even composed the band's theme, Remem Remem Remember it was called. You could see the score, it's here. And he arranged for the swingingest of all the dance bands in Pittsburgh, the all-black band, Honey Boy Minor and his Buzzing Bees. The, but he was fired from the group. I interviewed, found Minor and interviewed him for my book, and Minor matter-of-factly explained to me decades later that he heard a rumor that Strayhorn liked boys. His own band broke up because Strayhorn was black in an otherwise white group. The leader of a black band wouldn't accept him because he was gay. It is not hard to imagine the satisfaction Strayhorn must have found in the opportunity to work for and with Duke Ellington, a musical genius, let's not forget, who was already wildly popular and renowned for making supremely advanced and heterodox black music and who fully accepted Strayhorn as a gay man and made plain through his example that everyone in the Ellington organization was to accept Strayhorn fully too. Once he began his association with Ellington, Strayhorn rarely discussed his early career, in part because he was rarely asked about his career outside of his work with Ellington. When Dan Morgenstern interviewed him for Downbeat, Dan's first question was, how did you and Ellington get together? Much the same when the radio host Paul Wirth interviewed Strayhorn in Los Angeles in the late 1950s, his first question was, how long have you been with the Duke? I want your reflections on being with the Duke and working with the Duke as long as you have, end of quote. The implications were obvious. Strayhorn's musical life had to begin with Duke Ellington, even though it didn't, and his thoughts were worth hearing if they were thoughts about Duke Ellington, even though he had much more on his mind. Now, this gets more complicated. Strayhorn tended to let this th kind of thing slide shrugging it off, shrugging off the diminishment he encountered in the few interviews that he gave. Often, in fact, he leaned into it, sending false signals or giving misinformation to throw people off course. In just one of many examples of this, Strayhorn was interviewed for a meeting of the Duke Ellington Society in New York in the early 1960s, and he described his career in Pittsburgh like this. He said, I wrote little things and wrote lyrics, you know, just kind of things to do. Up until the time I met Edward Kennedy Allington, I never really thought of music as a career, end of quote. Uh -huh. Little things, like lush life. <laughs> in that interview with Paul Worth, Worth asked him directly if he had written any songs before he met Ellington. Strayhorn answered, well, they were unheard. They were just heard by the customers of the, uh, the, the drugstore customers. Mm -hmm. Right, except for everything in fantastic rhythm and something to live for and your love has faded and all the other songs his own band played, and Remember, and what we know of as Samada, and all the other pieces performed in dozens of shows for several years, except for all that. Now why, 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 we might ask, would so serious and ambitious a musical artist be so averse to attention he would dodge the facts or flat out lie about his own career. Part of the answer, without question, is that Strayhorn was genuinely humble, extraordinarily humble, and simply didn't need or want attention. As such, 
he and Ellington made symbiotic pair, pair. One, Ellington, thrived on adulation and excelled at navigating it. The other, Strayhorn, relished the emotional and intellectual intimacy of close relationships and was driven by creative impulses unrelated to the glories of fame. This was fortuitous since Strayhorn knew that widespread recognition on the scale enjoyed by big name band leaders and famous musicians in the swing era was something unavailable to him as a triple minority in the mid 20th century. What do I mean? Well, he was African American, he was gay, three, he was unafraid for people to know that he was homosexual. Can you imagine that in the 1930s? Now, it's important not to see the past through the lens of the present. He was not out of the closet in the sense that we know today. He and his first important partner, Aaron Bridgers, didn't walk down the street holding hands and stop under his street light and kiss. But they lived as partners, went together to public events, proud, proudly, unapologetically. The two of them would invite members, excuse me, I have a little something in my ear. It's called a hearing aid. So, uh, the two of them would invite members of the Duke Ellington Orchestra and their wives to their home for dinner, couples together. They signed their Christmas cards, Billy and Aaron. Strayhorn's identity was not an open secret. It wasn't a secret at all. And that's the way Strayhorn wanted it, the way he insisted things be. At the same time, he understood that taking such extraordinary pride in something still misunderstood and demonized in America, still pathologized and criminalized in this country, came at a cost. He could be open to everyone around him, but the rest of the world was not quite ready, and he knew it. Working with Ellington, Strayhorn could work his own way, making the music he wanted as a rule and be true to himself as a person. Now, working, they worked in tandem for 30 years. In tandem, each under his own power, but in coordination. Working in tandem, they created a body of work of unprecedented and still unparalleled depth and, and breadth hundreds of songs for every configuration of musical performance, from solo piano to full orchestra, long form suites, music for the Broadway stage, film scores, music for television and the ballet. Ellington conjured the freedom, the individualism, and the fierce intelligence of jazz and blues, fueling the music with creative audacity and bravura. Strayhorn tapped the harmonic sophistication of the French and subtlety of the French Impressionists and the elan of cafe society, infusing the music with rare sensitivity and grace. And he could also swing hard, as we all know from Take the A Train. In an interview with John S. Wilson for the New York Times, very late in his life, not long before he died, Strayhorn looked back at his career and spoke candidly and honestly about his approach to composing the music associated with Duke Ellington. He said, it works because he doesn't tell me what to write or how to write it. He just says, write something. He knows it's going to be me. The whole time he was working in association with Ellington, Strayhorn also composed, mu composed music on his own for projects unrelated to Ellington or loosely connected to Ellington. He almost never discussed this work again because he was almost never asked about it. 
among the revelations that the Strayhorn Collection here uh, offers us is insight into the significant quantity as well as the elevated quality of Strayhorn's independent work. An absolutely stunning example of this is the score of music Strayhorn composed for an adaptation of, of Federico Gar Garcia Lorca play, The Love of Don Perlimplin for Belisa in the Garden, which was staged, staged as a, at an experimental theater in the early days of Off-Off-Broadway. Can you imagine that? I interviewed the surviving members of the production team, including the costume director, Bernard O'Shea, and he said to me, quote, it was a terribly brave thing, a sort of a gay pride thing and a black pride thing at the same time. Sorry, I just in my ear. Very, very unusual for any time, any time and absolutely unthinkable in 1953. Another striking specimen of the originality and emotional potency of Strayhorn's work away from Allington is a three-movement suite for French horn and piano he composed in his final days for the duo of Willie Ruff and Dwight Mitchell. The score is here. As Willie Ruff recalled to me in my interview for my book, he said, quote, it's really Billy's autobiography. It's really the last words from a great genius shutting down before his time. It's all about frustration and anger, lost chances, missed opportunities. He's saying, I'm mad. God damn it. He's mad because he's checking out and he hadn't done, you know, he could have done anything. He could have been the biggest of the big. He could have done it all, man. His genius is right there in the music. But there he was checking out, and nobody except the musicians and a few of the writers in the jazz magazines knew who Billy Strayhorn was, end of quote. I said it earlier, and I'll say it again. Duke Ellington was a genius, but so was Billy Strayhorn. And this has to be said, too. There is room for both of them, and room for others in addition. He died from cancer of the esophagus on May 31st, 1967, at the age of 61. 51, forgive me, the age of 51. I guess it's hard to believe he was so young. Duke Ellington gave the eulogy, and I will read the last sentence of that eulogy. Duke Ellington ended his eulogy by saying he had no aspirations to enter into any kind of competition. Yet, the legacy he leaves, his oeuvre, will never be less than the ultimate on the highest plateau of culture." End of quote. Had he lived, had he lived one more year to 1968, when a lot of early jazz musicians were still alive, he would have seen the death of his dear friend, Dr. Martin Luther King, a defining tragedy in the civil rights movement that Strahan worked so hard for. Had he lived to 1969, when Johnny Hodges was still alive, he would have seen the Stonewall Uprising. Had he lived to 1973, when Duke Ellington was still alive, he would have seen the American Psychiatric Association remove homosexuality from its list of psychiatric disorders. Had he lived to 1987, Chuck Baker was still alive. He would have seen jazz become institutionalized as in the concert series that was the foundation for jazz at Lincoln Center, jazz at Lincoln Center. Had he lived to 1968, Irving Berlin was still alive. He would have seen the city of New York rename West 106th Street as Duke Ellington Boulevard. No one at the ceremony would mention that Duke Ellington never lived on 106th Street, though Billy Strayhorn did. Had he lived to 2001, when Lionel Hampton was still alive, he would have seen the Regent's Theater in Pittsburgh, renovated and renamed the Kelly Strayhorn Theater in honor of two sons of Pittsburgh, Gene Kelly and Billy Strayhorn. 
Had he lived to 2003 when his old Pittsburgh friend, Billy May, who sat in with the Mad Hatters, Billy May was still alive, he would have seen the Supreme Court overturn the so-called sodomy laws that criminalized homosexuality. He'd see that overturned if he lived as long as Billy May. If he lived even longer, which is conceivable, though very, very far from plausible. Okay, I looked this up. The oldest person still alive, Maria Brañas Marrera, was born on March 4th, 1907. She was eight years old when Billy Strayhorn was born. So he could have been alive. Had he lived to the centennial of his birth, on November 26, 2015, he would have seen the Manhattan Borough President take the A train to Harlem and proclaim the day Billy Strayhorn Day in New York. I know at least a few of us were there together because we were dancing <laughs> on the platform. <laughs> had he lived, please, had he lived till this month, had he lived till today, he would see a street kiosk in New York City honoring 315 Convent Avenue as the residence of Billy Strayhorn and Aaron Bridgers. He could go online, surf around Spotify after a brief lesson on what the word online meant, <laughs> and find more than 30 albums dedicated to the music of Billy Strayhorn, most of them recorded over the past 25 years. Had he lived, had he lived, he would have seen a day at last when all he represented, all he struggled for a lifetime to experience as a man and accomplish as an artist would no longer be radically unheard of, unclassifiable, aesthetically inexplicable, and socially unspeakable in terms of his identity as a gay man, illegal, and taken as a symptom of a mental disease, he would have found the worldly genre blending he pioneered in his music to be absolutely, utterly, fully embraced by artists in every sphere of creativity, from the pop charts, where Lil Nas X is making a queer, black hybrid of hip hop and country music, to the Metropolitan Opera, where a jazz composer, Terence Blanchard, is now writing operas on themes such as the travails of a black gay prize fighter. Strayhorn would find a world, apologinous music and art, a world reconfigured for the intersectionality Strayhorn embodied in his life and work. He was intersectional before it was trendy. He was, in, he was intersectional when the only people talking in the rhetoric of intersections was traffic cops. It is absolutely thrilling for all of us here and all of us in the world now to see and to know Billy Strayhorn as a, someone recognized as the great, one of the greatest, most original, most influential artists of the 20th century. More impressively to me, and I know this is not lost on the Strayhorn estate, as we know, more impressively, he was, in essence, a 21st century figure. His life and work were inseparable, the life being the source of the work's unique character, the work being the expression of the complexity of the life, and in their particulars, they capture the inclusivity and expansiveness of thought and heart that infuse the arts in our time. Our time, in our time. Our time is Billy Strayhorn's time. I so wish he could see it, I so wish he could be here now. I started my own work on Strayhorn and did the first interviews for my book when I was 28. And I continued working on the book for the next uh, 11 years, nine years of interviews with hundreds of people. The year I started was 1983. Billy Strayhorn, had he lived, would have been 68, my age, right now. He could have been alive, we could have met. Happily, there are some people here today who did meet and know Billy Strayhorn, including members of his family who are carrying on his legacy with 
great ardor and dedication. I'd like to ask for all the members of the Strayhorn family to stand and have, let's have a hearty round of applause for the Strayhorn family. With the archive under the judicious care of the library, it is now possible for anyone, everyone interested in getting to know Billy Strayhorn and his music to do so through the holdings of the Billy Strayhorn collection. And there is still a great deal to learn about him and that work. I say that with enormous excitement, even after all the years I put into researching Strayhorn. The holdings of the Billy Strayhorn collection offer innumerable opportunities for researchers to unearth new information and tease out fresh insights into Strayhorn's work and its meanings, meanings plural, Strayhorn's work and its meanings. As the scholar Lisa Barg has recently done through a close reading of Strayhorn's work through the lens of queer studies, we're gonna be hearing more from Lisa about that work in a few minutes. In the course of my own work, I was very, very fortunate to interview Strayhorn's closest friend, the incomparable Lena Horn. Over several years, we met fairly often, sometimes taking walks through Central Park and stopping at a park bench to eat a bag of lunch and soak in the natural environment. One reason we did this is there was something that Lena and Billy liked to do, just as he liked to do that in Hillsboro. Lena said to me, quote, he was my guru. I never met another man like him. He, we stopped on the street once because there was a carving on a door that interested him. He loved food like he loved trees and nature. He thought food was beautiful, the texture of an apple. He was very unhappy when people didn't treat food respectfully, end of quote. Lena told me she didn't see what Strayhorn saw at first, and had to learn from him how to learn from looking at things more closely. The first time you see a tree, she told me a tree is just a tree. But stop, look again, look more closely. The Billy Strayhorn collection, thousands and thousands, 18,000 pages of music, papers, photographs and other materials offers us thousands and thousands, 18,000 opportunities to discover new things if we stop and look, and look again, and look more closely. We could all continue learning from Billy Strayhorn. Oh, I don't think you're allowed to bring food into the library, but if you sneak it in, handle it respectfully. Thank you very much.